Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. I'm Deanna. I was just looking at what I was calling this episode today. I am prepared. Don't worry. I'm just acting crazy. Um, good morning. It's good to see you all. Happy Tuesday and welcome back. Martha, welcome back. Happy coffee time. And happy coffee time from Dover, New Hampshire. Doreen in New York. Happy coffee time. And mom, you are on. And it is lovely in Granby. It is lovely here too. It is another beautiful autumny day, a little bit on the cool side. It's, you know, depending on where you are in the country, we get this whole season in New England where in, in the course of one day, you can go from being super chilly, winter chilly, right? Like really need to be covered up to being terribly hot, sweaty, sweaty pit hot, you know? Uh, it's amazing the spectrum that you get in one day. It's not always nice, but it's New England. Robin, hello in Wisconsin, and Sue's in Kansas. Oh, I love those little emojis. Those are so cute. Good to see you. Crystal, hello. Good to see you. People were all abuzz yesterday about that article. It really was fantastic. I can't wait to get that magazine. I'm really excited to have that in the collection of important documents. Seriously, everything needs to be documented, and that is right up there. Barbara, hello in Toronto. Good to see you in April. Good morning. Tara, good morning. Did you not have internet yesterday? Has it been one of those crazy times? Oh, man, that ha that's a loaded comment. Good. Yay, I have internet. <laughs> I know those moments. Carol, good morning. Good to see you. And I still have not gotten my copy of AFA. I usually get it right away. I'm going to have to check and see. I was hoping I might be able to do a little with that uh, today, but I haven't gotten it yet. Linda, good to see you. Coffee time, chat time. Aw. Malia, hello. Good to see you. <laughs> Penny, hello. How are you? And Kira, my love. And Plymouth, good to see you. Webnob, good morning. Good to see you, Dave. Good morning. Justin Trudeau just uh, re-elected as Canada's Prime Minister. Who you scared me for a minute there. Um, I just love him, and I loved his dad, too, in the 80s, right? His dad was, I, th I, I think, a wonderful, powerful leader and a great uh, person and personality, that whole family. It's like Canadian. Would you say they're like Canadian uh, royalty, the Trudeaus? I just love, um, I've probably said this before, but sometimes when I'm in a bad mood, I just love Justin Trudeau, right? I just think he's just an awesome, amazing, smart person. And um, he's not that bad to look at either. So sometimes when I get in a super bad mood, I just type in on the internet, um, Justin Trudeau boxing, because he was a boxer back in the day and he had some great, great one-liners. Like it's not how hard you hit, it's how hard you can get hit and stand back up. Um, some great sort of universal one-liners, but there are some fantastic pictures of him online, boxing, you know, called, I'm going to stop, but you know what I mean. That always always puts a smile on my face no matter what's going on. Chrissy, I was just thinking about you. Good morning. And Catherine, good morning in, I, at, in Idaho. <laughs> I don't know why I just stumbled over that. I was looking at JT. Oh, Justin Trudeau. Okay. <laughs> JT. <laughs> That's funny. Martha. You're so tired from staying up late to watch the election. I've been completely oblivious of all of this. I am so ashamed to say. I'm, I'm really happy with that result. I hope everybody's happy. Of course, not everybody is. It doesn't work that way, right? Thank you. Thumbs up, please. You're going to have to Google. Oh, Kira, you do have to Google that. Um, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. We'll start on a better note. So, you know, what was I going to say this morning? There was one thing I wanted to say for the people who are taking the um, all tie dye dye class um, th this Sunday. I'm going to have to push it back. And I'm super irritated and frustrated. And I don't want to st uh, start on an uh, anxious note. But um, I keep ordering stuff, particularly from Amazon, and it says it's coming the next day, and then I get—I don't even get a notice. I can just see it's not coming for weeks, and I don't know why this keeps happening because I've ordered stuff for that class twice that I really do need to put into the boxes. Um, prime next day stuff, right? And then it just doesn't come, and I've, I, I'm ashamed to say I've been busy enough that I don't notice that it hasn't come. And then I realize it hasn't come and I can see it's like scheduled for days and I've already canceled a bunch of stuff that I need to put into those boxes to go out and um, reordered it. And the reordered stuff was supposed to come yesterday and it didn't come yesterday and it's not even coming today. It's scheduled for tomorrow by 10 p.m. You know, it's turning into and I'm not putting I, I love using Amazon and it's been a lifesaver for me so many times. 
but lately it's been quite spotty and difficult, so now I'm too nervous about sending the packets out in time. I have got to get more of those bottles. It's not worth sending it to a few and not to everybody all at once because we're all going to be in the same class. So I put out an alternate date that I hope works for people, and if not, I'll make it work for you. Of course, all these classes are recorded, but nonetheless, it's nice to be on in person so you can ask questions and really see what I'm up to. So uh, it was supposed to be this uh, the 26th, and chances are if it comes tomorrow, it, all this stuff would arrive in time. But I just don't like playing those games, you know, with Murphy, Murphy of Murphy's Laws, always got a special eye on me. Um, so I hate to play those kinds of games. I'll see what happens. If it comes, if for some reason it comes today, I'll send everybody an email and let you know. But when I checked this morning, it was like delayed multiple times. So I put a replacement date as, um, I know it's Columbus Day weekend, so I, that might not work for everybody in the class, but I, I put as an alternate um, Sunday, October 10th. That's like the only hole in my schedule, it looks like between now and death, which is kind of depressing. Um, also great, right? We have some good stuff coming up. Let's let's look together. Next next Thursday, the 29th, is the Designing Like Frida class. You know, I had my Frida thing out. I was working on that composition I did with her sitting in the middle. And do you know the painting where um, it had it's like framed almost like, what's the word? Um, retab retablo, something like that. You know, almost like um, you, when you see Mexican art and there's almost like a, a niche and there's often a piece of glass that's reverse painted. I know retablo has like, um, if I'm saying the right word, has religious connotation, which it usually does. Um, but in any case, Frida found this beautiful mirror that had this look to it, this very colorful painted border with flowers, big fat flowers and a couple of birds, which you know she loved, she loved her birds. And she actually, it was on glass, she actually uh, made a painting in the center of it using the old thing as a frame and then just putting her painting in the center. And I played with that frame and then put a different image of her in the center as seated. Um, because you know I studied costume, I got a degree in costume years ago and I love costume and I love uh, drawing it and looking at it. So I put a beautiful costume on her, but I've been trying to hook it and I don't have a ton of extra time. Every time I get to that face, even though I'm working in like shreds, not even number three strips, but even smaller, I keep doing the face and it, it the face looks good, but it doesn't look like her and it's driving me nuts. It's really driving me nuts. I threw the hook multiple times last night, bad nature. Um, and it was a nice Hartman hook, but it's fine. It's a fine, it's fine, it survived. But I'm, I'm not surviving the struggle with Frida's face. So you know what I was thinking? You know when you hit these walls with a project where um, I don't like faces and I'm not good at faces, I'm not good at shading, I'm just not good at that stuff and I'm not leaving it at that. I keep practicing and taking on things to try to get better at that stuff, but it bothers me a lot that it's an image of Frida and it doesn't look exactly like Frida, right? It bothers me a lot. There's only so much you can do with this, with this brow, right? It still really should look quite like her in my mind. I was thinking about as a solution, as somebody who loves Halloween, right, more than I love portraits of anybody, I love Halloween, um, I was thinking about keeping the composition just the way it is, and I'll show you tomorrow, her sitting within this beautiful, uh, I'm going to say retablo again, because it might be right, framework, and in this beautiful costumey dress, and I was thinking of replacing, this sounds awful, her face with, for example, a skull or a pumpkin you know, Headless Horseman style, or Skull Day of the Dead style, so that I'm keeping the composition that looks very Frida, and the only thing that I'm morphing is the face that doesn't look at all like Frida. I'm playing with that joy, good to see you, Donna, good morning, good to see you, Anne, good morning, Anne purchased her copy of Chatelaine, great, great article on rug hooking. Beverly says FedEx has been really slow. Not good about updates. I just don't understand the amount of garbage I get in all of my boxes every day. Why can't they tell me something important? Like your stuff is not within a week of its due date, even though you use Prime. I just, that's the, that's the kind of info that I would welcome uh, getting in my uh, trash box. And I get every other kind of trash. So, Mom, Frida is, uh, I'm sorry, you're right. It's Wednesday the 29th. I'm sorry, I said the wrong weekday. It's Wednesday the 29th and also Sunday, October 3rd. So I run that on one weekday and one um, weekend always. Is there a way, a way to make the face blank? There is, and I do typically like that, Kara, but to me, it, if, if it's not going to look like Frida, it's got to look like something else. It's got to be, like, I'm an all-or-nothing crazy person, so 
I just feel like I can't get it to look exactly like her painting and I don't know why I'm working so small and I've got all the contours and shadows in the right spots and it just, first the chin was a bit too square and then the, the under the eye was a bit too light and I'm working in a darker skin tone too, which I'm also not used to doing. Um, I'm just, I've, I'm fed up with it. It's at the point where I have to destroy it or make a decision about changing the composition. Sugar skull. Oh, maybe a sugar skull. That's not a bad idea. That would keep it festive. You know, I just want it to be something that I want to hang up in the studio and enjoy. And I don't want it to be something that reminds me of a lot of, like, agitata, uh, crazy grief and aggravation, you know. Oh, good. Mom says, I finally picked up The Prime of Miss Jean Brody at the library. So that is our book for this month, the Going Back to School month. It's uh, set in a girls' school. It's a British book, The Prime of Miss Jean Brody. If you want to join the book club and you don't have time to read the book, watch the movie with Dame Maggie Smith. It's a fantastic movie. I think it's an even better book. The book club meets on Thursday, um, the 30th of September. So that's coming up real soon, too. We've already had the next book announcement, but I'm going to save that till we're through with this book club so we don't get confused. Those two dates are coming up next week and not this coming weekend, but the following weekend on, on um, October 2nd. I do another fair for those of you who missed it the first time and you are local in Wethersfield, Connecticut. I'm bringing all that great ribbon candy hooking stuff. Uh, and the following day on Sunday, I'm teaching at, again at Madison Wool, doing the um, doing them as squares with a background. I just stuffed mine so I can put one of those um, wooden dowel things in it. But the pumpkin sugar skulls, there's there's like I think nine different choices, and we're doing them a little bit bigger than this with all kinds of fancy bling material. That is on um, that is at Madison Wool on. October 3rd and also on October 3rd at night is the second of the Frida classes. I know I'm cutting it fine but there's only so many days in a month. So we've got a lot of good stuff coming up and uh, and of course I'm teaching at Vermont um, at the weekend of October 16th. So October 16th I'm teaching at Mad River Fibers in Vermont way up north so that'll be real fun too. Uh, but And then the following weekend on the 23rd I'm teaching again on Cape Cod and I'm doing the uh, Mexican mola class, hooking a Mexican mola, pumpkin bat or cat. You've seen the cat, but I haven't done the other two yet. So all those things are coming up. We are on, my grandmother always used to say this time of year, as soon as you get to like anywhere near Halloween, you are on the landslide to the new year. And it is so true. It comes like this. We hit school, we hit fall, we hit Halloween, we hit Thanksgiving, and then whatever you're celebrating in December, you're probably celebrating something. And then we are there, right on the threshold of a new year. So let's make it last. Let's enjoy every second of it. Let's not be on that crazy bridge where we're looking to the next thing and passing time. Let's not pass time. Let's spend time doing things that we love and enjoy and make them last, right? Hello, Donna. Good to see you. Good to see you. So all that stuff coming up, all those great dates coming up, things for us to do together will be fantastic. Gosh, I feel like there's something else that was really pressing that I said on time. But now it's gone. Oh, well. So, you know, I want to get back. I was looking again at this book that we started and never finished, Bed Rugs. And the reason I'm so um, committed to uh, following through with, with a little bit more on this book than just the intro is because even though Bed Rugs are um, not immediately related to our rug hooking or punching, they are certainly first cousins at least, if not, um, you know, siblings. Because these bed rugs, some of them are done with a hook, right? We know that now. Some of them are done with a hook. Many of them are done with a needle, and it's very hard to tell the difference. In older books, we are not even getting a distinction uh, between, you know, what kind of a tool is making them. And at the end of the day, who cares, right? They're all beautiful, and they all touch on things that we do, certainly patterns that we would be interested in um, from the point of view of any kind of artist, but particularly as a hooker or a puncher. These are patterns that cross over directly to what we do, too. Dave says, The Prime of Miss Jean Brody, great movie. However, be warned, you will end up speaking in a Scottish brogue for the rest of the day. I hope so. That's so true. It was a great movie. It's one of my favorite books, though. I thought it was perfect for, um, you know, for September. I was trying to think, what's a book about school, about going back to school? And then I thought, that's got to be the one. And we have a great one for next month, too. Um, someone else is choosing the one for next month. I hate, I hate choosing too much because I hate to be the queen bee, right? But let me start this episode by, um, you know, I want to look at these bed rugs, whether they're hooked or sewn, in the context of their time period, right? Because 
when we talk about the history of rug hooking, we are talking about like the middle 19th century. And bed rugs are earlier. Now, hooking isn't earlier, right? Later bed rugs are possibly hooked, but hooking is not earlier. That's the timeline for hooking. But at the same time, we are looking at a piece of history that goes back, at least for Americans, right to the colonial period, the settlement period. That's my particular area of interest and when I was a tour guide that was my specialty was a revolutionary era and those um, the settlement years and then um, the years our first our first years as, as a nation uh, really big deal so I like looking at that point in history because there are a remarkable amount of influences at that time you think back to history being some kind of weird dark sterile bland time and it was so super colorful with influences crossing over from all over the world. The amount of trade that was done in early America is remarkable. Um, all those early ports, you know, all of those ports where big ships were able to come from the far, far, far east uh, were bringing the most magical and different and diverse things. We are picking that up in the design of that period. And that does cross over to us directly. So let me first start by showing you, let's start by showing a bed rug. And um, I'm going to tell you about the person who made it. And then we'll talk a little bit about the design of these early rugs. So this bed rug that I'm about to show you now, a bed rug is simply a coverlet, right? It's, it's, it's uh, a covering on top of the bed. So it's a rug, right? Because it's cold and you have your fire going, but um, most people during their early settlement days are sleeping in the main room, right? Essentially the living room where the huge hearth is, where you're doing your kitchen cooking work and you're always, you're doing your sleeping too. Um, there are not going to be lots of rooms to these old houses. There's not going to be a separate bathroom. There's rarely going to be a separate dining room or any separate room. The kids are often sleeping in the same room as their parents and often in the same bed. I know this sounds super romantic, but these are different times, of course, right? So a bed rug would have to be in New England in the winter, uh, very, very warm. So the idea of putting, getting, getting some kind of a backing material and adding heavy pile to it um, for warmth, that was very appealing. That made a lot of sense. So this bed rug uh, was, I'm going to read about her. I think she was from Vermont. Sarah Waterman rug, courtesy of the National Museum of American History at the Smithsonian. So the Smithsonian, the American Museum at the Smithsonian. Um, this is from their collection. Let me show it to you first. Now, it's just gorgeous. And it's curved, of course, because it was meant to accommodate the foot of the bed. It would be straight on top. So it would be kind of like a giant um, sleeping bag shape, you know but absolutely gorgeous, right? So in this book, one of the great things about this book by Jesse Armstead Marshall is that the, the rugs that she knows about, that she's researched, because she's restored some of these, um, she, she's done remarkable research, and she's able to tell us quite a lot about the person who made the rug. That's what makes looking at this book such a joy. So Sarah Woodward uh, Waterman, that's her rug, a maker of a colorful bed rug in 1794, was born in May, on May 31st, 1747. So 1794, right? Independence was 1776. This is 20 years later. This is like one generation later. Um, so interesting to place in that kind of a timeline because of course where she was in Vermont, Green Mountain Boys, Ethan Allen, all those sort of rabble rousing, uh, really aggressive rebels, right? That sort of population also very sparse. Um, she was from, sorry, Okay, so she was born in Mansfield, Connecticut, but she ended up living her adult life and dying in Norwich, Vermont. On Halloween 1827, at the age of 80, that was the day she died, at the age of 80, she was a daughter of Deliverance and Abigail Jewell Woodward. So Abigail Jewell is the mother, of course, and Deliverance is the father. And those names were really um, typical kinds of names in those days. If you ever get a chance to look at the, for example, Mayflower passenger list, you get a lot of... Um, names like Remember, Patience, uh, lots of virtue names, as you can imagine. Deliverance is a real particular one, huh? Uh, she was married to Lieutenant Samuel Waterman, uh, February 25th, 1771. Waterman was born uh, February 1746, so he was a year older than her in Basra, Connecticut. Uh, he died in 1809, so quite a few years earlier than him. So both of their, both of their stones are at the Norwich, Vermont um, Cemetery. I wonder if I've been there. I wonder if any of you have been there. I'd love to look at these stones. I bet they're beautiful old stones. At one time, it was thought that Sarah and Samuel's daughter, whose name was Saber, S-A-B-R-E, Saber, that's 
quite nice actually, made the bed rug, but she would have only been six years old when the rug was made. So we can eliminate that. Saber was born in 1788, Norwich, Connecticut. She was the seventh, seventh child of this couple. The rug was made by Sarah and it's stitched on a dark woolen plain, a plain weave foundation. So it would have been something that was woven either by her or by somebody she knew. It is 89 by 97 with rounded corners at the foot of the bed, uh, fashioned in the shape, say, to accommodate the bed. Later owners of some rugs cut the, co cut the lower corners to fit high post beds. Well, that makes a lot of sense, right? Cutting slips, like envelopes, slips into it. So the four posters could be accommodated, which is flap over the sides of the posters. The large central motif is a leafy uh, vase located on the base. There's initials, it says. Some of these things are hard to tell in that photo. Uh, it's blue, yellow, sepia, tan on this dark background, sewn with a running stitch with both cut and uncut pile, and it is at the Smithsonian Museum, uh, the National Museum of History and Technology. That's where it is, not the American Museum, because there is an American Museum, but it's mostly art, right, at the Smithsonian. This is the National Museum of History and Technology. Um, so interesting. Let's look at that one more time, and let's look for some of those things that she just mentioned. She goes into this kind of Okay, now I see the initials and the date. She goes into this kind of crazy detail with all of these rugs. Up here is the date and the initials, if you can see. It's a very dark ground. So this is not all completed with uh, stitches or, or a high pile, right? It's a dark background. So it's almost more like an embroidery in its approach because she's only, she's only colored some of it. Or if you are a hooker who collects, for example, Victorian era hooking, you often find, I'm sure, examples of um, feather tufting, which is when you take in this case, like a pillow or a bed covering, and you leave the background showing, right? And you only pick out, sew, or hook the motifs that you're interested in. You leave the, the rest of it showing. That's called feather tufting. And that is related to hooking and punching. Hooking and um, shuttle punching, right? Which is essentially punching. So interesting. So I read that, and then I went backward in the book, and I looked at this chapter she does that's super interesting called Sources of Design. And this really got me going because it got me thinking about history and design in other places, other cultures. We do this a lot on this show, right? We talk about design and where, where ideas come from. In fact, somebody, maybe it's somebody who's on right now, posted on um, the Facebook group. Our Facebook group is Rug Cooking and Punch Needle Club. Um, was away traveling this weekend. Oh, man, I'm so frustrated. I'm never going to find it if I look for it. Um, it was one of the buddies who always posts and posted, um, was away this weekend, saw all this beautiful stuff like a plate on the road that looked like a manhole cover and um, some textiles and, and wrote something like, inspiration for hooking designs is everywhere. If it's somebody on here, tell me because my brain is like a sieve this morning. Hello, Patricia. Hello, Lisa. Oh, that's all right. I'm right here. You didn't miss us. I'm right here. But inspiration is everywhere, right? And that's what this chapter made me think about. So she talks about, uh, Jesse, the author, saying the oldest type of surviving needlework in England is ecclesiastical embroidery, which makes a lot of sense, right? You glorify God by doing all this beautiful work, vestments, things for the altar, things that people will see in church situations. Um, also crosses over with our book from last month, which was A Single Thread, I think that was called, right? Tracy Chevalier. Um, about making embroideries for a church in England, making um, footstools and, and um, needlepoint stuff. But she goes on to say domestic embroidery followed in the wake of church-sponsored needlework was where it was at. So the church actually often paid for this kind of needlework so that their church would be decorated in the most grand celebratory way, right? It would be like a spectacle uh, to enter in and see all this beautiful needlework on the kneelers, um, you know, on, on cloths that were being used at the altar and on, you know, if it's the kind of church that has the Stations of the Cross, there's all kinds of textiles that you need. And that reminds me, I haven't, I don't, I don't know if I've said this on Coffee Time, but have any of you seen that video on um, YouTube about this little church in England, right? And they discovered that folded up under glass or plexiglass or whatever it was, must have been glass originally, in the shadow box frame, they had a textile from the church, which they believed to be the original altar cloth, right? Somebody, somebody happened to go in one day who was a costume scholar. That's how I somehow got hold of this video. Try putting in some of these keywords if you're interested in watching. Uh, it was like a BBC short documentary, but this woman was a, co a costume scholar and she was searching for the dresses of Queen Elizabeth, 
right, which would have been unbelievably grand, insanely grand, um, disgustingly grand, really, right? So, and with these giant uh, basket uh, panier type sides on them, massive pieces. She was searching for them. And when she entered this little rural church in the godforsaken middle of nowhere, she saw on the wall this uh, glassed in shadow box of this textile. And she thought to herself, this is not an altar cloth. This is way beyond the, the, the pigments that were used to dye these threads to sew this thing. These are, this is not an altar cloth. So somehow as it transpired in the video, she gets permission to take it out. And when she took it out, it was a dress, or at least the skirt, the pannier part of a dress. And it was Queen Elizabeth. She was able to verify looking at paintings and portraits um, and drawings. It was, I mean, rarely did Queen Elizabeth, or would she wear the same thing twice uh, for all the expense that it cost. Um, she just didn't do that on her grand progresses through the countryside, staying at people's houses at their expense, right, and making everybody bankrupt as she went. But it was indeed her dress, and it's a great video if you get a chance to watch it. But that's just an example of how, particularly in England, right, back in the day, it was so important to hang uh, really important textiles up because it was something that people could relate to, too, right? But it was never an altar cloth. It never was. They just assumed it was because it had been hanging there for so long. Interesting, right? See if you can find that video, it, video, and if you can, if you can post it onto our Facebook group, I think people would love to watch that. I'll look for it, too, a little bit later. So she goes on to say, Jesse, writing this book, goes on to say that the earliest surviving pieces of needlework, in, at least in England, uh, the earliest example is the Bayou Tapestry. And I think most people have heard of that. It was made by an ecclesiastical group in Canterbury, England, and depicted the Battle of Hastings, right? So celebrating an event um, in England where William the Conqueror of Normandy defeated uh, England's King Harold to the Battle of 1066, right? That whole 1066 country, if you've been there, all those beautiful towns like Rye, um, that are Hastings always calling themselves 1066 country, uh, marking a war event and a change in leadership the way that we were in the U.S. in 1776, right? The same thing, uh, making all these kinds of tapestries and things to commemorate that event. So the tap tapestry was commissioned by the Bishop of Odo, who was the brother of William, uh, and was made at a, nun a nunnery in Canterbury the following year, so 1067. And the tapestry was a tremendous undertaking by the standards of that day because it is an all-embroidered, not woven tapestry. There are many distinctions of tapestries, just like distinctions of, of rug hooks, uh, rug hooking pieces and punch needle pieces and shuttle pieces and um, sewn pieces and shared pieces and caterpillar pieces and penny rugs and applique. There's many distinctions within uh, weaving, too, but the Bayou tapestry is not woven, it's sewn, which makes it remarkable. So she goes on, she gives a long sort of... Um, explanation of the kinds of motifs that are found in that tapestry because of course anybody who was aware of that tapestry visited it saw it heard of it saw pictures of it reproductions of it in other places would be copying elements of it right of course they would because that's that's a great reference point right ships uh, people particularly men right because it's a battle scene but there are women in the in the bayou tapestry um, trees animals all kinds of things you would be seeing those exact motifs popping up you know, for decades, many decades after, because it was like looking at Vogue magazine and copying a dress, right? It was like, these, these, are, these are the images that are in my mind. This is hip and happening and now, and you would try to copy the same thing. Well, this is the way it goes with embroidery and hooking too. She goes on to say, just side note, that in Elizabethan times in England, women did very little with wool embroidery. So, you know, as a scholar, if you look at needlepoint slash hooking slash any kind of textile, if you're looking at England and you're finding wool, you really are looking at the work of the lower classes because weirdly they would be working in wool at that time and everybody else would be working in like silk uh, and really because of Queen Elizabeth and her court, right? She set the tone for like the entire, uh, gener many generations because she was the leader for such a long time. But they were working more in fine, fine, fine silks and uh, metallic threads and rare pigments. So if you find anything wool from that period, um, you're looking at something that was made by a person of a much lower class, right? Uh, and of course, the people of the very lower class, classes wouldn't even have time to do embroidery, so that wouldn't even be a thing. You're looking at something of sort of um, upper lower class or lower middle class. But it, she goes on to talk about the kinds of motifs that you're going to find. 
um, from subjects like the Bayou Tapestry, from subjects like the Bible, from illuminations that uh, monks did at abbeys. These are the kinds of decorations that you're going to be seeing and copying during all of these hundreds of years because it was all you saw that was decorative. That was it, right? Unless you are doing something straight from nature, which not many people would have the confidence to undertake, um, you're copying something that you've seen or that someone's described to you. So there's going to be a sameness to all of the decoration from this period. And of course, there is a completely separate conversation. Of course, there is always um, a whole world of languages that are different, right? When we looked at that, the tribal rug, which is still behind me here, that's probably Incan that Joe got all that great, really close um, images that were very close to these individual um, symbols there's always the chance of, of matching up symbolism, but also particularly within the English culture being such an old culture, uh, being so sort of folkloric and based on uh, myth, fantasy, folklore, oral history, right? You get a lot of other languages, like for example, the language of flowers is gonna be a big deal in English art and, and thus American art too, right? Because it's gonna carry over with people. So for example, during periods of time when gilly flowers are very important, um, you will see lots of gilly flowers, right? 17th century, lots of gilly flowers. Um, at times when the Tudors are, are or versus the Lancaster family is, is like ruling, in the ruling roost, you're going to see that particular kind of a rose. And it's going to change from time to time like a fashion. And those fashions are going to carry over to uh, North America too with the people that come with them. Of course, years later, but still. So she does talk about carnation-type flowers um, with the scent of cloves, woodbines, climbing plants, ivy, hun honeysuckle, trefoils, right? We, use, we still use that a lot or have done historically in church windows. Um, so she's talking about all these distinctions, the different kinds of things that your eye would look for if you are in the know and you know what you're looking at. And it all means something, and it's all magical and special. It's its own language. And all of these motifs came over with people and their books when those people came to the U.S. It is absolutely, Carl. And you know what? If I had an iced tea, I'd be drinking it too. I am so parched right now. I wish I had anything, anything like that. It sounds, it sounds decadent right now. Um, but, you know, she synthesizes all this information. She gives a lot of great information about the kinds of motifs that we're seeing. And again, I know I've said this before, but it's worth cementing. This, this sort of era of decoration and design we often refer to as Jacobian design. It doesn't mean it's all from the years, the Jacobian sort of era. It just means that that style of design that, that made a seamless transition into cruel work, if you're a needlepoint person, cruel, C-R-E-W-E-L, that style of design is pulled directly from ecclesiastical um, work. Right, things that you would see in churches, things that people would remember, things that people would have copied for many, many generations. And those things last, right? They become classics because they were done and redone over and over and over for so many years. They became the traditional, and that becomes traditional work. And we now have a word for those patterns. We say cruel or Jacobian. Um, but for years, they didn't, right? It was just you did your trefoils or your cloves or your carnations. They didn't have um, a, a category, a, a word to sort of bookmark that whole style of design, but we do now. So that's, um, I guess, helpful in a way. But she talks about how bed rugs, at least in New England, um, were pulling from these kinds of designs. So traffic with Europe, which is a huge subject, um, of course, a lot of traffic interrupted by war, needless to say, you know, we had a lot of sort of boycotts of English everything. It makes sense, right? Uh, during the war years, which were a lot of years. But aside from that, not just traffic with Europe, uh, traffic with the East, right? She doesn't mention that, but that's a big part of the story too. All of these uh, ports along the Atlantic coast, all of that work, all of those things that we're seeing, I'm going to, um, I'm running over a little bit, but I'm going to wind it up. You know, I know that we've touched on this in other coffee times, but when you think about it, all of the designing that we're seeing from early America to now, right? But let's just stick with like the early years when the what they were seeing was dictated by what was coming in at the ports, right? So if you take for an example, a very important port like Salem, Massachusetts, you are seeing people and things and pottery and textiles and paisley shawls in the 1820s that we love to hook with still, right? You're seeing all of those things come out of these boats almost daily in a busy port like that. And isn't it remarkable to think that in the 
um, 17th, 18th, 19th century, you could be in a little town like that, pre-transportation other than boats, you know, donkey carts and horse carts, um, and you would see people arriving off boats, people too, with turbans and with national costumes on and with colors that you don't even know how, how they made that color, and with things. And the wealthier you were, of course, the more things you could buy directly from the boat, right? The custom office would be right across from the, from the dock where the boat came in. You would see these, whether you were rich or poor, you could be standing there and seeing these remarkable things coming and going and these remarkable, very different people coming and going. And even if you are not uh, from an upper class and you're not going to buy a paisley shawl or, you know, a rug from um, the, the Far East, you are going to see these things. You're going to see these things coming and going. And your eyes are going to take just as good of a photograph as anybody saying, I think I see what they're doing there. I'm going to copy that, right? And then you copy that and you put it on your bed rug. And then years later, you know, there is a gap in history where people go, how did they know how to do this design? It came from Portugal. How did they know that? It was so far away. There's no Port Portuguese people historically that live in this area. Well, that, that's how. They're buying stuff and they're seeing stuff and their eyes are big and wide and they are taking everything in because why not? They're not going home and watching TV. They're just keeping track of what's going on around them in, in busy towns like this. Um, you are you are seeing such a huge variety. This was the department store of the of the era. You are seeing a huge variety of designs and motifs from different places. And I wish that those people, I wish that we could time travel and say to those people standing on the dock, the day in Salem that they brought an elephant from the boat right up the dock, right, for a show. I know we have different feelings about those kinds of things now. But on a day like that, can you imagine how those people felt seeing an animal that size, first of all? Um, seeing the people who accompanied the animal and the way that they were dressed and the colors that they were dressed in. I would love to time travel and say to the people standing at that dock on any of those days, you are so lucky to see the scope of design and color that is coming through your town right now because hundreds of years from now, we live in our own little towns and we shop at home goods and we don't even see half the variety that you're seeing today. I would love to be able to say that to somebody. Uh, but it's remarkable. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. You love this era of history too. I love to cover it because it crosses over with everything that we do and everything that we touch. And everything since then is a reaction to or an, an evolution you know, built on to these early designs that we consider, at least in Western culture, to be traditional. Everything, everything is either an Andy Warhol reaction, the opposite, you know, we want the opposite of this, or uh, it's something that was built up from it. And we can easily trace the chronology of the design, not just the years, but the styles uh, from, from one generation to the next. So it's so important to know where all these designs came from. And it's so great to have books like this that are great history books where she's not just showing us. I mean, she is showing us pictures of bed rugs and she's saying these are some of the designs and this is what they're called and this is where they came from. Thank you, Patricia. And this is what they mean. Um, she's calling them by numbers because they don't have designs, right? We, we sometimes... Um, hijack traditional designs and, and refer to them as their quilt designs. And I'm not against that because at least that gives language to the design, right? But everything has been used in quilting, right? Quilting is like ever, ever spanning epic um, parallel to every other kind of art and craft. But a lot of them have been hijacked, but we don't actually have names for the original kinds of designs. You could just say, for example, this is carnation flower. So that's what it is. I mean, that's how people, that's what people were doing. We we're making a carnation flower and it looked like this. And we use it to this day um, as a design. So it's in this book at least numbered, but she put together really colossal group of drawings um, at the end, things that people would have appliqued, sewn, hooked, or embroidered onto these early bed covers to make them beautiful. I mean, they were going to be warm anyway, right? But if you have the chance to sit and make something also beautiful, um, that thing that's within everybody, that they want to decorate things around them, that creative part that's in every single person, um, you would sort of seize on that and capitalize on any moment by the window that you could get or by candlelight that you could get to make a beautiful peacock or gilly flower on the thing that you were working on. So I'm going to leave it there for the moment. I'm probably going to end this book tomorrow. I just want to cover the part about, I want to look at some more specific bed rugs in color um, and talk about the women who made them. So that's my plan for tomorrow. Um, yeah, in some of these biographies too, she talks quite a bit about 
um, the schooling that the person had, whether it was at home or going to like a, a girls' school, which would have been basically a school doing crafts uh, back in those days. But we'll talk about some of the women who made some of these very notable rugs. And I forgot to tell you, remember I wrote to the Wadsworth um, Athenaeum in Hartford because they had two exhibits, one in, the, one in 1972 and one in, I want to say, 1980, maybe 384. Um, and I wrote to them a while back when we first started this, and I said, do you have Jesse's rug? Because it was there on display. Um, do you still have that? Is it on display? Is it somewhere, you know, in, in your vault of, of, like, beautiful things that we don't have space for? Um, and they finally wrote me back and said that they, they weren't aware that they had Jesse's. It was not conclusive at all. They weren't aware that they had Jesse's. They looked up the name. It was, um, I think it was a curator of textiles that wrote me. Um, looked up the name and said it was, you know, not somebody who was associated with the museum, which we already knew. It was somebody who just did this rug and it happened to be in part of this display, but it was hanging there for some time. So I'm going to have to go in a bit, a bit like a dentist and do a little bit more drilling into like nasty little places to try to figure out a little bit more because it seems like at this moment it's not clear where that particular uh, bed rug is. But she mentioned that she knew that there was an exhibit in the 1970s and that they might still have some of those textiles um, in storage. So that might not be something I can get my hands on anytime soon, but I'm certainly going to persist and see if I can find out more about the specific rug. Because if you remember, when Jessie did this rug, she was told it was the first rug that had been done for like 150 years. So I feel it's important she hooked it. I feel it's important to at least know that this rug is somewhere safe and that we, at some point in the future, will have the opportunity to look at it in huge detail. So that is a big to be continued. Oh, thank you. Well, hey, we will, con we will conclude with this book tomorrow. It does have more gems. It has more gems for us. And I don't want to skip over it. I've done a lot of interrupting the flow of this one. Um, but history is something you can come in, into and out of with, with like no seam at all. So we'll look at some uh, dye recipes, some of the early dye recipes, um, and some of the early rugs, photographs of some of the early rugs that some of these women did back in the day. That's what we'll do tomorrow. So, hey, I will see you then. Have a great day until then. Um, and back tomorrow, same time, same place, noon Eastern Standard Time, Ribbon Candy Hook and Channel. I will be here. Take care until then. Mm -hmm.